What is up, everyone? Today we'll be talking about EMSA, or the Electrophoretic Mobility Shift Assay. I'd love it if you did three things today. First, take a look at the tutorial, make sure you understand what EMSA is, how do we use it, follow the protocol, and actually try it out in the lab. Number two, click the like and subscribe button. We'll be learning a lot of different methods on this channel, and I'd love it if you kept learning along with me. And three, visit SciGen.com. Once you know that you want to do EMSA, SciGen.com is a search engine for biology and biochemistry methods where we've got over a million different biology methods for free indexed from all the different articles out there. So just type in EMSA and your protein of interest and you'll have a protocol that you can actually use in your lab as soon as you get out of these crazy coronavirus times. That's it. Let's get going. All right, so what is EMSA? That might be your first question. EMSA stands for Electrophoretic Mobility Shift Assay. Let's break this down. What does this actually mean? Electrophoretic, that sounds like electrophoresis. If you don't know what gel electrophoresis is, make sure you check out my other YouTube video about gel electrophoresis where we break it down step by step and go through an entire protocol. Mobility shift, what does that mean? In EMSA, what we're doing is we're seeing whether a particular DNA binds to a particular protein or maybe a protein complex. And we do that by observing whether there's some kind of a mobility shift when you run the DNA along with the protein or protein complex on a gel. An assay, well, we're testing stuff, so it's an assay. That's what EMSA stands for. And at the end of EMSA, what you end up with is a gel that looks like this. Here, your DNA ends up being at the bottom. Your DNA is the smallest thing that you're running on your gel, and it travels the furthest. If you don't understand why this is the case, make sure you review how electrophoresis and gel electrophoresis work in my other videos, and I've linked them in the description of this video. Now, besides your DNA, your DNA and protein might actually form a complex. And that's what you might see here, a band that's higher than your DNA is. And potentially, your DNA and your protein might form super complexes with other proteins. And that's what you see over and above. So that's what EMSA allows you to do. It's a really cool technique to see if a particular piece of DNA interacts with a set of proteins using gel electrophoresis. Now, you might be wondering, how do you actually do all of this? We're gonna go through a protocol here by Nature Protocols, and we're gonna see how you actually conduct an EMSA step by step. Let's get into it. All right, so the first step of EMSA is making some kind of labeled DNA. In EMSA, you have to be able to detect your DNA in your gel using some method, and here, I'm going to be presenting the different kinds of methods you could use. The first one shown here is fluorescence. So in fluorescence, what you normally do is you take the 5' prime hydroxyl and then you add a thiophosphate group onto it. There are labeling kits, just like this one from Vector Labs, that you can do this very easily with. And once you add that thiophosphate on there, you've got a thiol, and you can use a thiol reactive label and then add a fluorophore onto the five prime end of your DNA. And of course, this would label both the five prime ends of your DNA. So that's your first method. A second method, which is kind of old school, but also very common, is to add a P32 label onto your DNA. And here you can see kind of a similar thing. So you've got a DNA molecule, and here we're gonna incorporate a P32 instead of a regular phosphorus. To do this, you first have to take off this phosphorus using an alkaline phosphatase. And after you've made this into a hydroxyl, now you can use a polynucleotide kinase to add ATP that already has P32 onto the DNA at the five prime end. If you want some really detailed instructions, you should really visit this protocol from Promega. Here's the protocol from Promega that I really like. It tells you everything. It tells you how do you go about dephosphorylating that five prime 
phosphorus and making it a hydroxyl using the alkaline phosphatase. It then tells you how to use a polynucleotide kinase to actually add your P32 ATP onto that last 5' prime hydroxyl. And then furthermore, it goes into how do you detect how much activity you actually got. So what is the percentage incorporation and specific activity of your P32 labeled DNA? And it also tells you how do you remove any unincorporated nucleotides. It's a great protocol and you should definitely use it. This protocol from Promega is in the description of my video, so you can easily check it out there. The last method that you can use to detect your DNA and to label it, of course, is biotinylation. Here, there's a simple protocol from GeneLink. I'll link to this in the show description. And here, all you have to do is biotinylate your DNA and then use some kind of a streptavidin based label to detect this biotinylated DNA. You could have streptavidin fluorophore, you could also have a streptavidin that's radioactive, whatever you choose. There are a whole bunch of different methods of labeling your DNA. And of course, now that you've got a labeled piece of DNA, we can now run it on a gel and detect if the DNA bound or did not bind to your protein of interest using the EMSA. And that's coming up. We've got our DNA ready, and it's now time to prepare a gel. As you can see here, we're actually using a polyacrylamide gel. If you don't know what this is, you should check out what SDS Page is. And I've made a different video about it. I'll link to it in our description. Using SDS Page, we were able to previously separate out proteins based on their size. In EMSA, we have to separate out protein DNA complexes based on their size. So that's why it makes sense to use polyacrylamide here. Once you make your gel, you can actually simply just store it at 4C. I'm not going to go into the details of how do you make a gel because I've covered that in my other video about gel electrophoresis and you're free to check it out there. In the picture below, you see what a gel electrophoresis apparatus looks like just for your information. This nature methods protocol suggests doing some pre-electrophoresis while we're preparing the samples, which is actually step number four, and that's coming up. So pre-electrophoresis, the idea is you can run something like dyes with glycerol just to see if your gel has formed properly. Running a gel once doesn't break it down. And in the case of this pre-electrophoresis, we're just running glycerol solution so it doesn't really affect any of your sample that you're going to load later. This is what they're trying to avoid. You don't want to see lanes that are actually malformed like this one. That's why the Nature Methods Protocol suggests running pre-electrophoresis. This is good practice, but a lot of times, at least when we were in lab, we didn't always run pre-electrophoresis. Another reason you might want to run pre-electrophoresis is if you wanted to distribute something throughout the gel, such as cyclic AMP in the case of this protocol. But that's very protocol specific and you should decide on your own whether you need to run pre-electrophoresis to distribute anything in your gel for your EMSA. Our next step is to prepare samples. But before I get into the equilibration and how you actually dilute samples, I want to talk really quickly about native gel electrophoresis versus SDS polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis or SDS page. So in our case with EMSA, we're trying to see if a particular DNA wants to interact with a particular protein. And for that to happen, the DNA needs to interact with the native configuration of the protein because most likely there's some kind of charge-charge interactions or some kind of a binding pocket within our protein that's allowing it to interact with the DNA. That's called native gel electrophoresis because the protein is in its native state. In SDS page, we utilize a detergent called SDS, which disrupts all the charges within the protein. And in that sense, by disrupting all the charges, the protein has no tertiary structure, so it doesn't look like that, it looks linearized like you see on the right side. By having a linearized protein, we can't really have it interact with DNA, for instance, because 
it doesn't have that binding pocket anymore. It doesn't have any of those charges anymore. So that's why you want to utilize native page in EMSA. Okay, so now that we've covered native page versus SDS page, I'd like to next talk about what these guys say we should do, which is a titration protocol. So we're going to have DNA interacting with protein, right? In order for that to happen, there needs to be enough DNA in solution and there needs to be enough protein in solution. But if you add too much protein, maybe the protein aggregates. If you add too little protein, maybe it just doesn't interact with the DNA and you don't see anything. So that's why you have to run a titration. What we see in this picture is a titration where we're slowly increasing the amount of protein over the course of all the different lanes. So here we've got very little protein and you can see there's not much binding to the DNA. Here you can see almost all the DNA bound to the protein and form the complex. There's only a little bit of F or free DNA here at the bottom. That's how the M cell works. And this is why we do a titration to find the optimal amount of protein so that we can actually bind all of our DNA. You know, I started this channel with the hope of educating high schoolers and college students and anyone really interested in biochemical methods, biochemical techniques to learn how to do real lab techniques with a step-by-step -step protocol approach. And I really hope that you like this content. So I'd appreciate it if you click that like button, that thumbs up at the bottom of the video, and you click subscribe because that tells YouTube that this content is useful and it allows my channel to grow so I can put more time into making the content even better in the future. Furthermore, if you have any questions, just put them down below and I'd be happy to answer them for you. With all this, let's keep going on our EMSA protocol because we're just about to run our gel and do our analysis. Our next step is to load the gel with our sample. There's no real trick to it, except that you should be using these gel loading tips. And what they state here is to minimize the protein DNA complex from getting dissociated. You should try to minimize the time that the gel runs. Also remember that any buffer that you use for your protein or for your sample or for your gel running buffer, all those buffers actually utilize the native running state. So that means that their composition is very different than what you would use for SDS page, which has a whole bunch of detergents. Our next step is to actually analyze the data. So after we run the gel, we're essentially gonna have a whole bunch of radioactive DNA along with protein complexed inside a gel. And we need to be careful about how we handle this. So the first step, is to take your gel out very carefully and wrap it in plastic without getting your bench and your gloves contaminated. That's what's shown here in this picture. After you wrap it, we're gonna be using auto radiography to be able to look at the data and see where the DNA bands are. And to do this, what we do is we take film, which is auto radiography film, and we put it in very close contact with the gel. Of course, the gel is wrapped in plastic and all the P32 from the DNA that's inside the gel is now gonna hit that film and cause it to have captured the signal that's come from the gel. And this signal is gonna happen everywhere throughout your film, wherever there's DNA and wherever there's protein bound to that DNA. At the end, you should get data that looks something like this. Here you can see that we've got free DNA at the bottom, some kind of a DNA complex that's shown up here, and then super complexes of multiple proteins or different complexes of proteins binding the DNA and forming bigger and bigger complexes that have a bigger and bigger electrophoretic mobility shift within our EMSA. And that's about it. I really hope that you've enjoyed this tutorial on EMSA. And now you know how to label your DNA, make sure that your gel is set up properly, run your gel using conditions that make it native rather than have some kind of detergent that prevents the binding of your DNA to your protein, how to do titrations to make sure that your DNA and protein have the right concentrations in order to interact, and 
you've learned how to analyze the data once you've done all of this work. Now that you're ready to actually run an EMSA, go on to SciGen.com and search for EMSA along with the protein that you're interested in. And you can find a bunch of different protocols. Also, don't forget to like, subscribe, and ask any questions. This is Carter, signing off.